actually <laughs> that actually was defined um, a few months ago by John Combers as the next Silicon Valley. Well, synthetic biology. What is it? What is it aimed at? What fields are associated with this term? And what fields will be affected from synthetic biology in the future? We will explore this interesting issue together in a series of five events, approximately. Well, today we will hear an overview about synthetic biology, as this is the first one in this series. And we will highlight the aspect of pharma and therapeutics, listening to pitches about impressive developments in this arena. Um, I'm Hamut al the CEO of Jalan City, and I would like to share with you that uh, Jalan City team members see this exciting emergent field of synthetic biology as a major priority area, and that um, with every morning moment of um, learning about it, I, I can tell you that the excitement grows. So um, for the opening of this special event, I would like to first thank the Israeli College of Engineering in Jerusalem for kindly hosting our Zoom meeting today and invite a key person in this institution and also a great friend of Yale University, the head of pharmaceutical engineering department, Professor Debbie Shalev, please. Thank you, Hamutal, and good evening. Um, I want to welcome everyone, and uh, it's great to see everyone after the holidays. Azraeli College is honored to host uh, JLM virtually at what really promises to be a fascinating event this evening. Uh, the Department of Pharmaceutical Engineering at Azraeli College has uh, personal ties with a number of the companies uh, that will be presented this evening, and we have graduates uh, working in uh, at least two of them that I know of. Even I have a distant connection, which even the CEO doesn't know about, and uh, I don't usually uh, tell long stories here, but uh, I will uh, briefly share with you um, Mother Nature's sense of humor. Many, many years ago, a young uh, doctoral student by the name of Shmulik Itach came to me and told me that he would like to look at the structure of spider silk proteins. And I'm a structural biologist. I work on NMR. So I said, sure, um, you know, does it have a repeat unit that we could work, you know, cut truncate and, and just look at the repeat unit? And he said, yes, I'll, I'll bring it to you. And he brought it downstairs and he shows me a piece of paper that basically says P, 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 G, 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 P, 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 G, 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 G. And it really looked like the sequence god got its fingers stuck on the keyboard as he typed it out. And I think it's the first and possibly only time that I laughed out loud at something that was uh, so scientific. So once upon a time, synthetic biology was really the stuff of science fiction. And it's absolutely amazing to see what uh, people are doing nowadays. I greatly look forward to hearing about the newest directions. Thank you very much and enjoy your evening. Thank you very much, Debbie. Very interesting. <laughs> so um, for those of you who attend Yale City event for the first time, I will just say that Yale City is actually a nonprofit organization that is aimed at developing the bio business ecosystem of Jerusalem within the whole Israel bio industry. And that is by bringing together bioprofessionals, academy people, entrepreneurs, investors, and business people. And thanks to the hard work of our team members, Jalamba City maintain different projects that activate various um, collaborations with governmental institutions, with medical centers, with academy, and also, of course, with the core, with the industry. And that is in order to accelerate the medical and bio innovation, bring it faster to the market, and promote the bio ecosystem. I would like to thank um, Yale University team members and especially Mr. Joe Van Zwaren, Dr. Vitali Shilo and Dr. Gabi Pell for the work towards this specific event. 
During the next session, we will hear from Dr. Yohan Danieli, partner and head of AIMON Alpha at AIMON. Um, and unfortunately, in a short notice, Yohan had to inform us that he will not be able to be with us today, nor physically, neither virtually. But Yohan's colleague, Dr. Victoria Balanik, will be with us today to represent AIMON. And we will have the opportunity to listen to Dr. Daniel's lecture as he kindly recorded it for us. So I'm delighted to invite Dr. Yaron Danieli to give his lecture. Hello, everyone. Good, uh, good evening. Um, I want to start by apologizing for not being able to uh, sort of come on live this evening due to a last minute uh, scheduling conflict. Um, the only way I could think of really making up uh, for, for, for not being able to attend is think of a, a not just an adequate replacement, but, a, but an upgrade uh, for all of you. So uh, online today would be my uh, uh, very smart, very experienced and talented colleague, Dr. Victoria Balanik, uh, uh, a principal uh, within the Immune uh, platform, the Immune Fund, and uh, she'll be available to respond live and, and comment on things that I say, probably correct me here and there and, and provide her own perspective. Uh, as we talk about synthetic biology, this is an area that's still evolving and obviously different people have different thoughts, uh, likes and dislikes about, about this field. Um, I did want to uh, be able for the next few minutes share at least my perspective on, on the field, uh, how um, we uh, view synthetic biology uh, here at Moon, what we've been tracking over the last few quarters and, and where we see this field going both near term uh, and longer term. Uh, for that, I've prepared a, a very, very short uh, slide deck that, that will help us uh, um, through. So let me just share my screen uh, and we'll do this. And hopefully this will work in the, in the pre-recorded uh, video. So um, for those of you who um, are, are, are not familiar with the moon or myself, um, let's start with me. My name is Yaron. I've been in the moon for about two years. Um, I'm a partner at the fund uh, leading investments in early stage. Amun has uh, two funds, uh, which we invest out of. Amun Velocity is our early stage fund. We do pre-seed, seed, and A rounds uh, at Amun Velocity, checks ranging from about a few hundred thousand dollars to a few millions. And Amun Growth is sort of a mid to late stage fund focused predominantly on sort of later stage assets, checks start at $10 million. Things have to have some sort of commercial traction or very late uh, stage clinical uh, data for, for the immune growth partners to, uh, to dig into. Um, uh, myself, I'm a scientist by background, PhD in biochemistry from NYU. I came to Israel about 20 years ago, did a postdoc at the Weizmann, got my business degree from the Technion, and then spent about 14 years in industry, uh, 10 years of which as a CEO, uh, including both private and public companies. I then spent three years um, in Jerusalem uh, at a, one of the most amazing jobs um, I've held. I was the CEO of Yisum, the tech transfer for uh, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And during those years, I uh, was part of the spin out of, of, of a few dozen companies, uh, the raising of uh, three seat venture funds and the signing of you know, hundreds of licensing uh, and research service transactions uh, with that amazing university in Jerusalem. So uh, I, I'm proud to say sometimes I'm an honorary Jerusalemite, uh, and this is why I was really hoping to be able to, to attend live, uh, and, and I hope to be able to still attend uh, in, in your next events. I was asked to just give a few introductory comments on, on synthetic biology, and maybe I'll start by uh, sort of how I view this, this construct. It, uh, for me, it's always careful to try and avoid hype uh, and really understand when someone's talking about synthetic biology, uh, are they just decorating an old approach with, with new language, or is it really something that has to do with what we see as a relatively recent phenomena uh, in the creation of this, of this discipline? And so I think, you know, the way at least I explain to myself and to others what synthetic biology is, 
is synthetic biology is, is one of two things. It's either the use of biological material, something that's naturally occurring, to generate a new, unnatural, unseen before product or service. Um, to give you an example, uh, a synthetic organism. So take an existing E. coli or yeast or, or phage and, and then synthesize to create a new version of that uh, organism that's not naturally occurring. Or for example, using uh, a biological uh, um, a molecule, uh, an, an interaction between a receptor and a ligand to now create a molecular sensor uh, to detect and, and sometimes uh, generate outcome uh, from, from sort of biological molecules that were never used in that way uh, before. And the flip side of that is, of course, the use of synthetic materials, unnatural materials, to create a biological like or a, a to mimic a naturally occurring biological process. So uh, neural networks is sort of the oldest uh, uh, construct that, that sort of uh, fits this, this mold. But if you think about synthetic cells, uh, like a, a synthetic red blood cell made entirely out of synthetic materials mimicking the effect of the red blood cell or, or platelets, for example, or uh, the other construct you can think of are proteins that we synthesize de novo, not in not in a natural uh, uh, you know, cellular system, but maybe in a cell-free system, and then incorporating into them unnatural, non-canonical amino acids. Be, and we're able to generate new protein structures and hence new protein functions because we are no longer constrained to the um, amino acids that we have available and the ability to synthesize certain things in a living uh, cellular system. So, all in all, the, the, this is how we think about the field of synthetic biology. And a lot of people would add into it a lot of data science and computational biology, and, and it's okay. I mean, again, no one has uh, the right to include or exclude particular things from this construct. But if you ask me about what synthetic biology is, and particularly what makes it so outstanding and, and, and exciting, uh, is, is these two constructs, using natural products to make new and unnatural uh, product or vice versa, trying to leverage the natural products and capabilities of, of, of nature to create a new uh, system and a natural system. Now, um, maybe take a peek at what's been happening in the synthetic biology investment landscape. Um, it, it's been quite volatile, particularly in the last quarter, but if you go, if you, if you sort of zoom out and take perspective over this field since, you know, 2009, let's say, yeah, the last um, you know, 10, 12 years, what you see is that the last year or so has been sort of a, a transitional, transformational year for synthetic biology. We're talking you know, more than four and a half billion dollars uh, of total investment in the field of synthetic biology by and large um, in Q1 and, and Q2, which is the last uh, data point that we have, it's almost uh, as much. Just to give you a sense, the total invested uh, in 2021, or the projected total investment in 2021 alone, this year alone, will be as much as the entire decade that preceded it uh, before. This is how much money is flowing into, uh, into this field. Um, the amount of deals in, in the space is also sort of breaking, uh, breaking records. We're talking uh, about 37 deals on uh, um, average. Um, and each one of them at an average of uh, $120 million. Now, again, this is not a nice bell curve. Uh, this is um, a very heavily tilted towards some very uh, large deals, um, but, but, but overall, um, you, you are seeing um, a lot of transactions, a lot of investments, both private and public investments going in over the last year or so into what, what is, appears to be a, you know, the new darling of uh, healthcare and, and, and medical investment. And, and honestly, that's not very surprising, right? If you look at uh, the breakdown of these billions of dollars flowing into uh, SynBio and where they're going, they're going predominantly uh, to three areas. Uh, the, the leading area is health and medicine. This is uh, uh, what we all sort of immediately think about when we think about synthetic biology. That category continues to dominate uh, in 2021, both Q1 and Q2. And it's not surprisingly, um, I remind you that one of the pioneers 
of uh, synthetic biology, uh, a company called Moderna, uh, is, is uh, you know, synonymous these days with, uh, with, with COVID and sort of uh, a rescuing part of humanity. So I think the, the excitement around what a, uh, a synthetic biology play like Moderna and others could do to the future of medicine uh, is obvious, and that takes the entire field uh, forward. Uh, again, I want to note that Q3 saw a major correction. Uh, it was a broad correction in healthcare um, and a particularly uh, painful correction for this for this sector in uh, in synthetic biology. But but even then, uh, I think if you look again for, uh, as a, as with a general perspective on what has happened in the last year or so versus you know if you go back five or ten years, uh, we're still in the in the sort of very exciting days uh, of this field. The second uh, field that is getting a lot of attention is organismal engineering. Uh, now, again, this is sort of outstanding because of the very large Ginkgo deal uh, uh, that happened in Q2. But even beyond that, a lot of deals are happening now with organismal engineering. Uh, these are engineering of all kinds of organisms, from single cell organisms uh, to, uh, um, uh, to multi-cell organisms, such as in vivo gene editing. And finally, the field that that's, um, have, that showed uh, robust performance in Q1 and continues to be steady in Q2 is food and nutrition, a, a field that I used to be uh, highly involved in back when I was at Yisun. We were not as involved in today uh, at, at the moon in, in, in this field. But uh, this is something that I think will actually be relatively stable over time uh, um, because there is significant uh, benefits and opportunities in the field of synthetic biology as it relates to improving yield, uh, protecting crop, uh, and making very, very interesting uh, products such as artificial uh, uh, meats and, and alternative protein uh, sources. So uh, this field, this field is showing a lot of uh, a lot of success as well. I wanted to end by, by sharing with you where we have been uh, sort of uh, diving deeply into synthetic biology and where we see um, um, continued growth, uh, um, both near term as well as uh, uh, long term. And there are four sort of general areas that I'd like to, to mention. The first has to do with the continuous disruption of the R&D industry. Um, you know, we, uh, at least I'm old enough to remember how we used to do a lot of high throughput screening and dump giant libraries on, on, on systems and sort of uh, massive trial and error efforts in trying to identify uh, hits and leads and, and optimize leads. Uh, we are seeing now that this industry uh, being revolutionized by tools that allow incredibly more cost effective measures of um, um, leapfrogging the early stage R&D effort, whether it's computerized, um, you know, modeling and, and searching and, and, and synthesis of, of new compounds, whether it's um, uh, smarter libraries uh, and generation of unique libraries like Twist, um, whether it's, uh, you know, looking for leads in most uh, cost-effective systems. We are investing in a company in the targeted protein degradation pathway that has developed a, a, uh, a system to rapidly screen uh, in a much more effective, better signal to noise ratio uh, for a new uh, protax and blutax. Um, folks that are disrupting the way we are um, processing uh, DNA, RNA, and protein samples, the companies like Sequentify, who's doing this for, um, uh, for DNA sequencing. So, there is um, incredible excitement about what we, you know, sometimes refer to as the democratization of early stage R and D, and tools that are um, helpful in sort of leapfrogging the the, the 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 billions of dollars that the industry spends uh, in in a sort of a classical trial and error search for new leads um, are are gaining a lot of attention. The second area that, that uh, synthetic biology is, um, is, is, is focusing on is new molecular generation or production capabilities for both natural and unnatural entities. So um, even if you've got um, um, you know, an idea of a certain agent uh, or a certain product, a certain molecule or macromolecule that you want to generate, uh, we've been using pretty old standard methods of um, optimizing these molecules, as well as eventually manufacturing 
producing these molecules. And what we're seeing now with the, you know, with the rise of synthetic biology are very exciting companies that are able to re-engineer systems for, again, much more uh, robust and cost-effective um, 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 uh, optimization as well as production capability. So for example, um, there's a company called Amid uh, Technology in Boston that's able to print uh, proteins like we print you know, research reports um, at very high purity, great yield uh, with uh, either natural or unnatural amino acid. And Thea is a company that's uh, leveraging the yeast system to uh, produce uh, opioids um, and, and synthetic opioids. Uh, Synthrax is another um, example of an unnatural uh, amino acid company you may, have, uh, you may have come across. So the ability to now um, 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 break free out of old production uh, um, and, and, and testing system and be able to look at new uh, constellations of proteins and macromolecules, new configurations, and be able to optimize them both in a computerized as well as a wet uh, uh, environment is, is really disrupting the way uh, we, we think about the future of therapeutics. The third element is uh, sort of um, an old one. Uh, I, I was uh, working in elements of cell and even gene therapy uh, uh, 20 years ago almost, but we really see cell and gene therapy not just coming of age, but really stepping into a new age, um, which, which focuses really uh, on not just on uh, you know, obtaining cells from an organism or from humans, manipulating them uh, um, epigenetically in some way and returning them to the human, but actually uh, doing a lot more invasive engineering uh, in synthesis, both in cell and gene therapy. Um, you know, we, this, this includes the world of, of sy completely synthetic cells, even synthetic tissues, even synthetic organs. It looks at uh, the world of non-viral uh, gene therapy and, and targeting to uh, you know, sites of uh, inflammation, tumor, um, et cetera, uh, blood-brain barrier technologies. A lot of these um, areas are now, again, relying on engineering principles to achieve and to overcome uh, some of the hurdles that, uh, um, that, that this field has been sort of struggling with um, in, in the last decade or two. Again, as we, as we experiment and as we do things, we're going to hit roadblocks. You know, and gene therapy uh, is, is a bumpy ride for sure. But I think that as we hit those road bumps, we are now equipped with the tools, the engineering tools to think around them and, uh, and sort of drive around them. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, if we understand what's making some of the viral uh, uh, vectors uh, problematic in some, some circumstances, I think we are finally um, equipped with the capabilities, the engineering capabilities, start thinking smartly about how to go around. And finally, the, the last area that, uh, that I'll touch upon is, is the idea of being able to completely step out of the natural system, step out of the wet lab, and have finally enough computational power and enough knowledge to mimic, to modulate how cells, how tissues, even how organs or entire organisms react to certain interventions. So we have seen now um, a, a group, an, an increasing group of companies that are able to slowly model, not even in a wet system, not even in an organ on chip model or, 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 or things like that, but in an entirely virtual model. There's enough information today and enough computational power, for example, to model the human heart, uh, and it's, uh, you know, millions of variations, kids, adults, old age, sick, um, healthy, male, female, and start modeling what certain interventions, pharmaceutical or even device, could look like. Uh, uh, replacing, uh, eventually, some of the need in those extensive, expansive, and, and highly risky uh, um, um, clinical experimentation with more robust analytical tools in the early development pipeline. So um, you, hopefully you could tell how excited we are and I particularly am about this field. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause and, and allow you to hear from my, again, very talented colleague, uh, both a little bit more about the immune approach and, and how we look at things, as well as answer any questions you may have. 
Uh, I uh, really look forward to be able to connect with you guys uh, uh, live uh, in the future. And again, feel free to email um, email me, email us, reach out to me via via LinkedIn if you'd like any help or support, or if you have an amazing new idea in the synthetic biology space, uh, I'd love to talk to you about it. Thanks for your time uh, this evening and enjoy the, the session. Thanks to Yaron Danieli, Dr. Yaron Danieli. And I'm delighted to invite Dr. Uh, Victoria Balanik. Um, hi, Victoria Hello. is <laughs> Victoria is a principal at Amon Velocity, where she is involved in the scientific and commercial evaluation of investment opportunities. And she also supports the management team of Amon portfolio companies in all stages of company formation. Um, I would tell you also that Victoria is a multidisciplinary biomedical professional with extensive expertise in healthcare innovation. She is a scientist by training with more than 20 years of experience in research and also in business development, first in academia and then in pharma industry. So hi, Dr. Balanik. Uh, thank you for, for the opportunity to present here. Well, uh, first, I would like to thank you for your willingness to join us in such a short notice. No problem. <laughs> I would like to, to ask you, so could you please describe the Moon Investment Fund and its focus of interest? So as, um, as uh, Dr. Yaron Danieli mentioned, uh, Emun is uh, the largest health tech fund in Israel. Um, also one of the youngest. So Emun manages uh, $1.3 billion in two funds. Uh, one is called Emun Growth. This is for late stage investments. And the second invests at very early stages. Uh, companies coming from academic institutions, uh, venture creation, sponsored research. This fund is called Emun Velocity. Uh, we are uh, indication agnostic, disease agnostic. Uh, we invest in device, pharma, digital health. But actually, um, what uh, specifies us is the motto of the moon. Um, we are dedicated to uh, accelerating cure. So any technology that has a chance to get to patients to um, give an answer for an unmet medical need will be in our investment scope. Thank you. So how many companies are there in M1 portfolio? Um, as I mentioned, we are a young fund. Um, we have made so far about 30 investments uh, and also a handful of sponsored research programs from our early stage fund. Um, and um, I need to say that about 20% of the companies we invested are actually uh, seen bio companies. Uh, yeah. And uh, again, as Yaron mentioned, the definition of a seen bio um, is, is not very strict. So if we go wider, we can even double this number, probably to about 40% of our company uh, will have some kind of accent in, in seen bio. So you have now 20% uh, of the bio and, and you think um, even of doubling it. So uh, why actually does Amon consider Symbio as a field of interest? Well, as I mentioned, we are dedicated to um, cure acceleration. And synthetic biology is, is a new concept, is a new field that uh, helps uh, to deliver in the fields where conventional technologies failed. And there are many examples, starting with um, self-free protein synthesis and uh, engineered cells, um, many uh, different approaches for drug delivery. Uh, all these solutions um, made possible only using synbiotechnologies. So actually, we are looking for these um, new approaches to access 
uh, old problems. Okay, thank you. Um, Iran and also you um, mentioned um, investment in specific, uh, you know, the names of, uh, of uh, specific Synbio uh, companies. And I want to ask you, um, thinking of your field of expertise and about your role in AMUN, um, while evaluation of a company for investment, what are the main issues for evaluation and whether uh, you can say that there is a difference or different difference or maybe different emphasis that, that can be defined regarding evaluation of a sin bio company? I'll start from the general aspects, uh, which probably will be um, uh, right for any kind of company, Synbio and uh, also other. Uh, first of all, we are looking at the technology. We are looking for a novelty, for um, extraordinary solutions uh, to accelerate cure, um, to be able to get to patient, actually um, developing uh, solutions that will become drugs, come to the market, and uh, provide real cure to real patients. Uh, Amun is a, a for-profit organization. So we do care about the competition, about the market size, about uh, the development timelines and development costs. But again, the major aspect is being able to deliver a new technology that will help real patients. Um, on the other side, we not only invest in technologies, we also invest in people. We believe that great technology uh, will require a stellar uh, team of experts. Uh, this is how we build companies. We, we do have a great technology, uh, let's say coming from an academic institutions, and then we work hard to find the right people to develop this technology. Because, uh, even best technologies would not be able to survive without you know, proper people uh, dedicated to this. And uh, to your second part of the question, what is different with the evaluation of the Synbiot companies? Um, as you mentioned, as, as you know, it's, it's a new field. So we uh, many times see um, Synbiot related technologies in which technology is looking for an indication. So it's a great uh, technological solution, but it should be related to a specific unmet medical need. Uh, we do prefer uh, starting the other way, starting from, from defining a real unmet medical need and then finding the right technological approach to solve this problem. Thank you. Um, just uh, one more question. Well, um, Dr. Balanik, if you had to limit yourself to one advice, what would be your tip for Synbio company? Uh, a single one, right? A tough question. Yeah. So, um, I'll go with two. Okay. Actually, uh, the first one will be just I mentioned. Please when you uh, start your venture, think of, of a problem. Think of a un real unmet medical need and then find a technology that, that is able to uh, solve this problem. And, and second, I guess um, since this field is so new, at the, at the very early stages, you need to define the product, define the business plan, and also define how the regulation of your product will look like. New field, the regulation might, might not be available for this kind of technology. So it's very important to start early, to communicate with uh, regulation authorities, and maybe even to be part of defining the right regulatory path for your technology. Thank you, very important to, to think of everything from the very beginning. Thank you so much, Victoria, for this uh, thoughtful and educating session.
Thank you. And, we will now hear from uh, four companies that develop products in the field of SynBio um, that are associated with pharma and therapeutics. I'm pleased to invite our first speaker, Dr. Shlom Tion Shen, CEO at Civix. Dr. Shen, please. Hello, everyone. So I will share my screen with you. Okay, so good evening. And actually, Hamutala, I would like to take it a little bit more broad than uh, just medical. Synthetic biology has to do with many, many additional opportunities. And I think CIVIX is a good example for that. CIVIX uh, has developed and is manufacturing the first man made spider silk. Spider silk uh, has been uh, known as a very unique material that um, the dream of using it has been around for decades. And why is that? Have a look at this film. This is a fly that weighs about 10 times the weight of the spider web. The fly moves towards the web, flies towards the web, and the web does not tear or break. And so this is the power of nature a material with no compromises, no painful trade-offs between properties. It is strong and elastic, and the combination of strength and elasticity makes this material very unique in its ability to absorb energy, absorb impact. It is lightweight, and although it is composed of proteins, it is still very durable at high temperatures, and resilient to many organic solvents and strong acids and bases. Therefore, in this new era of biomaterials, spider silk has a unique value proposition. It has the desired mechanical and functional properties, but it is also a sustainable material. So many industries could benefit from spider silk. For example, the medical industry looking for biocompatible and biodegradable materials that are still strong enough to withhold pressure, tension, and movement of the body. The textile industry looking for eco-friendly, green, and sustainable textiles the automotive, aerospace, and defense industry looking for high impact absorbance and lightweight materials. However, spider silk cannot be extracted from nature because spiders are cannibalistic and territorial. So you can't farm them like silkworms that produce their silks. And Civix is manufacturing SVX uh, in its lab without the use of spiders at all. The SVX spider silk biopolymer is animal free, vegan, eco friendly, degradable, and sustainable. We are using synthetic biology to produce SVX biopolymer in controlled fermentation processes, just like you would produce vaccines or even manufacture beers. We use water, sugars, yeast, and a bacteria that is engineered to mass produce our SVX biopolymer. We currently have an operating pilot manufacturing facility in Jerusalem. We are now establishing our semi-industrial facility here in Jerusalem as well. And in 2023, we plan to have our uh, large scale industrial facility producing tons of material per year. We, we incorporate small percentages of our SVX biopolymer to various materials and we generate composite new and innovative materials such as films, foams, yarns, meshes that target specific tailored needs of our customers. 
And we can integrate this unique biopolymer into the various traditional and conventional manufacturing processes and production lines of our partners, such as casting, injection molding, hot press, extrusion, and spinning. So CVEX has decided initially to focus on the high value products. Our first ready to market product is SphereSieve, a scaffold which can be used for research purposes for stem cell research, cancer research, tissue modeling, 3D bioprinting, and uh, cultured meat. This is sold currently to researchers at the academia and at the industry. Our next product ready to market are formulations for cosmetic use for skincare and hair, hair care. We have an anti-aging, anti-wrinkle skin serum and hair care formulations for protection from uh, environmental pollution, from heat, from sun, and from color fading. And we have a strategic collaboration with ASICS, the sports company, to co-develop sustainable and durable material for their sportswear. CIVIX was established in 2014 based on uh, 10 years of research conducted by Shmulik Itach, the same inventor that Deborah mentioned at the beginning who came to her with a science fiction. And uh, we currently have in the company an exceptional multidisciplinary R&D team composed of biologists, material engineers, and chemists. We have a patented technology and products tapping huge markets. And we're looking for partners that would like to join us in this exciting journey, breaking the boundaries of innovation across multiple industries and developing the next generation, high-end, high-performance and sustainable materials that will be used in our everyday lives. Thank you for um, listening. And I thank the organizers for inviting me to pitch to you. Thank you, Shlomtian. I would like to invite Dr. Irit Kamilevi, CTO at Omiyun, uh, to present. Dr. Kamilevi, please. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we're good. Sure, good. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Irit Karmi Levy. I'm the CSO and VP R&D of Omiyun. Uh, we are a biotech company uh, established uh, just over three years ago. Um, we are based both, we have two sites. We are based both in Tel Aviv and also uh, we have uh, initiated a manufacturing site in Jerusalem, which made me uh, eligible to present to you guys tonight. Um, Omune uh, is focused on the development of personalized therapies for cancer. And in the oncology field, it has, um, it has long been known that uh, one size does not fit all or one drug does not fit all um, due to uh, complexity and heterogeneity of both tumors and the tumor microenvironment. These, uh, these called for a new uh, perspectives. And indeed, under development today and in recent years, uh, we see new, uh, new approaches and new technologies. Some are trying uh, to target specific mutations or specific uh, markers based on their uh, expression profile uh, on the tumors or in uh, specific patients. And some technologies are trying to harness the immune system uh, as for to mount an anti-tumor immune response. Yet, and despite really substantial progress uh, we have been seeing in past years with these new technologies, uh, still there are some indications and individuals who fail to respond uh, or to demonstrate a durable response for these technologies. And in Omune, we are trying uh, these days to take a new approach 
uh, to address this unmet clinical need. Uh, and our promising uh, innovative therapy um, has two distinct features um, that differentiate us uh, from uh, other technologies uh, currently under development. The first feature is that we take these two approaches of immunotherapy and precision medicine, and we combine them together into one drug. Um, our drug is a multifunctional one, uh, synergizing within itself uh, with uh, uh, several uh, modes of action. This is the first distinct uh, feature that we have in our technology. And the second one, which is probably um, more relevant for SynBio, and another reason why I'm here this evening, is um, how we customize the matching uh, of the drug per patient. Unlike uh, conventional targeted therapy or precision medicine um, technologies, uh, we are target agnostic. We are completely driven by efficacy. And I will show it in the next few slides, but we're looking for something to really, um, I'll say it very simple, to kill the tumor cells of the tumor of the patient uh, in a tube before we uh, administer it back to the patient. Our therapy is based on, a, on the Optimers technology. Um, Optimers, for those of you who are not familiar, um, these could be viewed as chemical antibodies. They share many, many uh, propensities in terms of binding um, with uh, good affinity and binding with good specificity to different targets. Only instead of being made of um, uh, amino acids like antibodies, optimers are made of nucleic acids. And that gives them uh, um, several um, advantages over antibodies and some we, are, we can exploit using uh, SynBio and to, to match and customize a uh, drug per patient. Um, and depicted here uh, is our medicinal compound. Um, as you can see, it is comprised of two parts. One um, here in, in, sorry, in black um, is, a, is a variable part. It will be unique and different for each patient. This optimer with its unique sequence is selected uh, for each individual patient based again on uh, the, uh, its ability to induce a substantial tumor cell death on the patient's own tumor cells. The second part of our molecule of our medicinal compound is a fixed one, is gonna be shared uh, between all patients. And this one um, is binding um, and engaging effector T cells, effector immune T cells. When we uh, fuse these two optimers together, the one that is fixed and the constant and the one that is variable, um, a, a third element is formed naturally. Uh, and this is the little bridge here um, in blue, in light blue. And we have designed this bridge in a way, in a manner uh, that will stimulate yet a third or another uh, component of the immune system uh, that, that would be the innate uh, immune cells. So these three colors uh, depicting three structural components translate into really three modes of action. Um, and as we're focusing this evening on synthetic biology, I will just zoom in for a minute about how indeed we choose the variable strand that, um, that is selected de novo for each patient. We start and we have um, a, in our labs a huge repertoire, 10 to the 15th uh, different potential optimers. Uh, and then we start passing these through the funnel um, and reaching at each step, looking for the most potent uh, optimer that we, that we can find. And we iterate again and again, looking for it to be pre-validated in the tube. Uh, we're uh, taking the, uh, the patient's tumor cells and we're checking and again and again, uh, what is the most potent optimer, which one uh, induces uh, the most uh, tumor cell death. And eventually we pick up uh, the, the best one. But, uh, on top of looking at the potency or the efficacy of the optimer, another very, very important element uh, is the selectivity or specificity of the optimer, um, as we don't wish to harm uh, healthy cells. So embedded within our platform, we also have um, many safety strategies to really de-risk um, the chances of us harming uh, healthy cells. Uh, we're using uh, different uh, 
um, a, um, different approaches in order to enable that that I'll not go into right now. Uh, but I can I can tell you that that has been um, heavily discussed with the regulator. Um, and when Victoria mentioned that it's um, that it's recommended uh, if you pave uh, the, the new pathway, it's, it's highly recommended to be in touch with the regulatory authorities. Uh, this is what we've done here uh, due to the novelty um, of the approach. Um, so OMU's process um, starts uh, with a patient coming into the clinic, providing us with two types of samples, one being a tumor sample or a biopsy of a tumor, but the second one would be a, a, a blood sample as an exemplary of healthy cells. We subject these two uh, tissues, the, the yield one and the health one to our platform. We select uh, the best personalized uh, optimer, which would uh, serve as the variable strength. We uh, link it to the fixed uh, part, to the constant part that uh, serves as the immunotherapy component, uh, and, and we administer it back to the patient. Um, and, and lastly, I will end with, uh, with some benefits uh, of our therapy. Um, first, um, we're saving a lot of efforts here uh, with pre-validating the efficacy of the drug in vitro before it is uh, tested in the patient itself. Uh, and secondly, and importantly, the fact that the, uh, the drug is multifaceted and multi, uh, multifunctional um, really maximizes the chances of success here. Uh, and what's more, uh, we can find a personal uh, optimer irrespectively of the tumor site. Um, so we are uh, open to recruit any solid tumors. Um, I'm afraid I cannot share um, any data. Uh, it's still under confidentiality, but we are presenting a very compelling uh, preclinical data next month in Washington in a CITC conference. Um, and we're gearing up just to commence our first in human clinical trial uh, early next year. Uh, and we're always happy to collaborate uh, with uh, complementary technologies. So feel free to, to reach out and, uh, and contact us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Reid. Sure. Our next speaker will be Mr. Arya Bhatt, the CEO of Process Bio. Mr. Bhatt, please. Thank you. Um, I apologize. I'm, I'm speaking from uh, somewhere between uh, Raleigh and, and Winston-Salem in North Carolina. I hope you can uh, hear me. Um, Precise, uh, bio is, Precise Bio is a company in the field of regenerative medicine. We're not exactly synthetic uh, biology. We fabricate tissues from uh, human cells, from natural materials. Where, if we look at the, uh, there are various trends today in, in healthcare. Uh, people are living, of course, uh, longer these days. Um, there are trends as big data, uh, internet of medical things. Healthcare is going personal, much more personality. The world population is living longer, so there's need for um, uh, spare parts, things uh, uh, as everybody has in their car, things uh, uh, malfunction. And this leads to the new trend of biofabricated tissues. And it might sci uh, seem science fiction today, but I would say that in 10, 15 years, we will be replacing many, many uh, organs in our body not from uh, donors, but uh, from fabricated tissues in the, in, in the lab. So precise visions of future where people won't have to wait for life-saving or uh, life quality tissues, but will be able to uh, receive them from uh, fabricating uh, mechanisms. One of them is 3D printing, of course. And we are targeting to two areas today. One where there isn't sufficient supply worldwide of tissues and another where there's a therapeutic need that replacing a damaged or diseased tissue with a new uh, a tissue can solve that uh, a unmet need. Why this field now is coming and really um, uh, maturing because over the last uh, uh, 30 years, the various technologies have been uh, maturing. We're talking about 3D printing, specifically our type of printing lift uh, uh, based on a laser uh, printer. Cell biology has advanced and it's not no longer in science, but really reached a mature phase. Biomaterials are existing now. And we are at a stage where we can combine all of these technologies together, which are required to fabricate tissue. 
if we look back, uh, my partner, uh, uh, Dr. Anthony Atala from the Wake Forest Institute, he transplanted an engineered organ in a patient um, almost uh, 20 years ago. But we don't see these technologies in the market because all of the, the supporting technologies and the ecosystem had to mature. We established Precise in uh, 2015. Our first uh, in vitro tissue was in 2017, in vivo in 2019, and we're targeting our first clinical study in, in 2023. And this really is a new path of uh, fabricating tissues and organs to transplant in, in uh, people. And we are in a new era from that uh, perspective. The, the things do not, these technologies do not exist currently and are not reach the clinic, but they will be. And if we look at it, what is required is really to combine uh, many technologies together. It's really a multidisciplinary approach, um, 3D printing together with cell technology, together with biomaterials, bioengineering, how we um, connect various types of cells to other natural materials, cross-link materials, et cetera, and really engineering, bringing all of this together uh, to fabricate clinical viable tissues. Uh, you can see here in the, in the movie just how it looks. Uh, our uh, printer here, um, 3D printer that we have developed based on laser, um, laser technology. And with this uh, uh, printer, we have already fabricated and transplanted tissues, and I'll show some examples later. The process that we use, and this is, uh, in general, it's correct for everybody who wants to fabricate tissue. We start from the cells, where we source the cells. It can be um, from stem cells, it can be uh, from a biopsy, take primary cells, then expand them until we have enough cells to fabricate or uh, large tissue or many tissues. We combine a bio ink, which is mainly comprised of ECM, extracellular matrix, cross-link materials and others. And then we reach the stage where we biofabricate. So if you think of your printer at home where you have a red, green, and blue. So we have endothelial cells, epithelium, collagen, and other, and we just flow these materials through the printhead and we fabricate the tissue. And then we have what we call the fourth dimension, a maturing phase, which uh, essentially is a combination of time and other processes where we mature the tissue from the fact that we have cells uh, structured in the same anatomical structure as we have in the body, but we have to uh, make it from cells to a functional tissue. And of course, since we're thinking of bringing these tissues through a regulatory process and, and commercializing it in a, a supply chain, so we have quality control that essentially goes through the whole fabrication process. Uh, 3D printing, I won't um, go into it because it's, we do it the same way that everybody other do, else does in any 3D printer where we have a 3D image the computer reduces it to a 2D slides, and then we build it layer by layer. The first area that we're active, of course, is the, the ophthalmology. And when you look at a cornea, for example, that's the way a cornea is structured layer by layer. So it was very intuitive to start from a ophthalmology. I'll, uh, it's not just uh, theoretical, but we uh, have already transplanted several tissues in preclinical studies. And as I mentioned before, we're moving toward the clinic. Um, and I'll show some of our results just to give you an idea how it looks. What we're seeing here is a cornea. At the bottom, we see a diseased eye where the endothelial layer of that a, a rabbit is damaged. In the middle, we can see the tissue, that slight line, um, dark line underneath. Here is the tissue that we transplanted. And you can see above that the cornea is now a transparent and functional meaning that we, this rabbit can see. Uh, we, of course, developed also the methods to ship these tissues around the world so they can be available to any place that is required. Uh, another tissue is also related to the cornea where here we transplanted a tissue inside the stroma where this can address also a, uh, a therapeutic need as keratoconus, but in the future also it can address vision correction. People that are not eligible for LASIK, for laser uh, shaping of their cornea, here we can transplant tissue, which is of course is built from the same material that the uh, human and uh, native tissue is, is uh, comprised of. And we see here results after three and a half months where we have stability and clarity of the cornea. 
Uh, we can also shape this and it can be personalized. And this is done with standard uh, laser equipment that is exists in any eye clinic. You can see here on the right that we have a shaped cornea where if a patient has astigmation or other, other disformation, we can compensate for that on, on the shaping. And last but not least, uh, I'll show an example of a retina tissue where we come to address AMD, age-related macular degeneration, one of the leading um, diseases to, to blindness, where we had to develop, of course, also the a transplantation tool, the delivery tool, where we uh, developed together with doctors at the uh, Ichilov, uh, we developed this tool where we can do a subretinal transplantation. This is how the tissue looks. And if anybody is uh, familiar with uh, retinal tissue, it looks exactly like the native retinal tissue. And here we can see transplanted in a, a animal model. Um, we can see here the tissue that after two months follow-up, it has really in, um, adhered to the native tissue. And this is very promising results. This is the first time that we're showing this. These, um, these results are just uh, from recent. And this can address one of the most uh, significant unmet needs in the ophthalmology field age-related macular degeneration. Uh, this is the beginning. We started out in ophthalmology, but of course the platform and the platform technology can support other areas as orthopedics, cardiolo cardiology, nephrology, and we will be addressing those in the future. Um, together with me, we established the, the company, uh, Dr. Anthony Atala from the Wake Forest Institute of Regenerative Medicine and Professor Shai Soker, uh, also from Wake Forest. Uh, uh, before that, he was a professor at Harvard. And both of them are leading scientists in the field of regenerative medicine. And the Wake Forest Institute is the largest institute in the US, 450 scientists that are um, addressing various uh, regenerative medicine technologies. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. I'm pleased to invite our last uh, speaker for today, Dr. Einat Zesman, the CEO at Tissue Dynamics. Thank you for inviting me. Just let me know if you can see my screen. We're great. Perfect. So thank you for the invitation and I am aware of the time, so I'll try to be brief. Tissue Dynamics is a startup from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and our focus is on sensor-based drug development where our scientific focus is on the metabolic imbalance as the novel mechanism of disease. Uh, our platform provides destructive advantage in drug discovery and development because our technology can allow for significant reduction in drug development costs and risk because we are focused on the human data and on the human organoids and not on animal models, which differ in various aspects from uh, humans. Uh, we also provide in uh, difference from other companies that are developing organoids on chip, we're providing deep dive into the understanding of the dynamic mechanism of action that takes place within the cells. Think of it as if we are the fly on the wall inside the headquarters, inside the tissues, understanding what is going on and not just the endpoint. Um, our system is animal free in terms of ability to understand the safety and, ass and assessment, and it is uh, time saving in the way to clinical studies. Our team is, of course, starting from Professor uh, Kobe Nachmias. Professor Nachmias is the director of the Grass Center of the Bioengineering, he actually established the bioengineering department in the Hebrew University, as, and he is a recipient of numerous awards. Our VP RD is uh, Avner Ehrlich, who is coming from the lab of Professor Nachmias, and also with a bioengineering background and the paramedical uh, officer in the army. Um, our, cl our clinical and regulatory uh, supervisor is the Dr. Yafit Stark from uh, uh, Teva, 
has uh, brought to the market several drugs with a lot of experience in this field. And I have been in the area of uh, early stage innovation in the last two decades in various capacities, both at the university side, as well as at the venture side by establishing uh, an incubator and ventures with it. So why do we need to look at uh, metabolic imbalance? Because all our cells are uh, needed, uh, need, needing, need energy in order to activate their, their uh, everyday function. And the changes in the way they're using the energy, the, cha the change in the way they're using the different metabolites, glucose and other metabolites, will affect their fate. So understanding what is the pathology, how the pathology affects their ability to, to strive, and how a situation like cancer, inflammation, or toxicity of drugs occur within the metabolic pathway is critical. The problem is that we don't have good readout assays to measure these flows and fluxes of uh, metabolites and energy. And this is where tissue dynamics unique technology comes into place. And it is based on three pillars. The first one is validated three-dimensional human models of tissues, liver, kidney, and others. The second one is the sensor-based monitoring of those metabolic pathways that are mentioned. And the sensor is practically either embedded inside the organoids that will create or just in the vicinity to measure the uh, flow of uh, metabolites coming in and out. And the third layer is uh, the ability to actually pinpoint the specific targets, the specific genes and proteins involved within these imbalances uh, using a genome-wide CRISPR technology in vitro. So let's look a little bit about the, uh, about, uh, the sensors. You see here the uh, round orange shapes. These are the uh, sensors with embedded within the organs that measure uh, oxygen. Here is an organoid of the heart. And I don't know if you can see, but it actually beats. This is a spontaneous beat because the organoids that we create spontaneously develop a pacemaker. The black elements are the sensors. They are not... Uh, uh, providing electricity into the organ. They are just measuring the electricity coming out of the organ. So look at it again. It's, it's spontaneously and uh, synchronizingly having a pacemaker by its own. And this is how we measure additional metabolites and we are able to follow the entire pathway of metabolism within the cell. So having all that allows us to pinpoint the disease. We start from the disease, we identify the metabolic imbalance associated with it, we determine which specific novel targets are involved in each specific pathology, and combine it with two compounds or licensed drugs, we can actually provide a solution to uh, revise the problem. So basically we're talking about uh, metabolic phenotypes of toxicity. And in terms of platform validation, we've done a lot, and I'll give you just a high, very high level uh, brief on what we've done. So in the first layer of understanding the metabolic phenotypes of toxicity, we were able to show with drugs that failed in the clinic, that actually pulled out of the clinic because of uh, hepatotoxicity, just, such as troglitazone, we were able to show the defect. Now in animal models, in order to show any type of defect with this drug, A, this was not identified before clinical studies or before the drug reached the market. And only afterwards in additional study when they found anything in animal models, they required much higher doses than the actual doses given to the patients. In our model, we, we see the phenomenon at concentrations that are effective dose concentrations, so the actual doses. The next layer is to find a metabolic rescue for the drug-induced toxicity. And why this is important? This is important because if companies developing drugs will collaborate with us at the stage of the development, they might be able to 
revisit, re redesign the drugs to to uh, uh, to work around the toxicity, or alternatively, they will be able to find another element, another chemical entity, to uh, protect the the organs from the toxicity. And we demonstrated that with cisplatin uh, uh, compounds that induce nephrotoxicity in. I think maybe 30% of the patients. And we were able A, to understand the mechanism, the glucose, uh, 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 the glucose accumulation that we, uh, triggers that toxicity in the kidney and provide a rescue through um, known drugs such as uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. Another layer is to take the metabolic intervention and understand diseases that are associated with it. And we did it with the COVID-19 uh, uh, epidemic, showing that the damage to the lung is due to lipid accumulation. And the specific pathway through PIPA-alpha, we were able to show the drugs like phenofibrat were able to reverse this. The last layer I'll speak in a minute because I want to show you um, data from the clinical studies with phenofibrat. So as I said, SARS-CoV-19 cells uh, accumulate lipid significantly. And we were able to pinpoint the exact pathway through, the, through our system and take phenofibrat as a drug. So here we did two things. The first one was a retrospective study looking at patients with COVID-19 that were hospitalized in Adassa. We were able to determine that those that because of comorbidities received phenofibrat to lower their um, lipid la levels um, for the, because of hyper, uh, hyperlipidemia, those patients had a better outcome even uh, with the disease. And secondly, we started a, a phase three study starting with an open arm and all the patients in the open arm were released uh, faster from the hospital, but not only that, they were also with much better uh, profile of inflammation throughout the process. The other very important element of our technology is the uh, rapid uh, pace within, uh, with, with which we get the information. So we started at, at May 2020 to study the uh, lung system. And in January 2021, we were already starting the prospective clinical studies, the open label study because of the uh, robustness of our system. And as I said, the last element, which is the focus, the current focus of the company is to apply all those technology to uh, determine novel targets in metabolic homeostasis to uh, as potential new therapies uh, in diseases. And the first uh, uh, indication that we're working on is fatty liver disease, where we identified a couple of targets that are unique in the human system. After identifying them in our genome-wide uh, screen, we also found that they were uh, differentially expressed in patients compared to healthy control. So this is our system. And to summarize, human-specific metabolic pathways are drivers of uh, many pathophysiology and toxicities in the body. In terms of synthetic biology, just to close around the loop of our talk today, we've developed advanced organ on chip model of diseases, and those are embedded with unique sensors that allow rapid continuous measurement of the actual activity in the organs. And our unique platform allows for that mechanism of action as, as a result, we uh, are able to pinpoint uh, uh, the safety of drugs, not only when there is a crisis of the cells that are killed, but throughout the way. And just to give you an, an uh, al 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 analogy for that, think about your car. If you only know that your engine is in trouble when the red light is on, that's already a no-go situation where you need to stop the car. But if you had known that something is going wrong, even when the full numbers are okay, just through the dynamics of the process, you probably would have been able to intervene at a much safer uh, stage and save your engine. And these are the concepts that, I, as I said, we have the support from the clinical data. And overall, this would provide risk reduction in drug development, saving both time and costs. 
Tissue Dynamics uh, is, uh, was established in 2017. We received a safe uh, $2 million investment about a year and a half ago, and we are now uh, on the process of uh, round A uh, funding, uh, aiming to uh, get uh, seven to $10 million. Thank you. Thank you, Enat. Thank you all speakers for impressive presentations. And I would like to um, thank each and every one of you for being with us today. Um, this, um, this presentation, um, this so uh, description of the pharma and therapeutics and other uh, aspects in the area of synthetic biology make us realize how uh, many there is to, to learn and um, what we can think of uh, in, in, um, when considering the effects uh, on um, other fields in future. Um, I would like uh, to invite you, each and every one of you, as um, in every uh, Jalan Bar City um, event, to, um, to um, connect to our LinkedIn group and also to stay for free networking, to stay and have coffee with us uh, for just 15 minutes. So uh, whoever wants, you're all invited. And uh, I will uh, thank again uh, each and every one of you and say uh, goodbye in our next event, our next event uh, uh, that will um, deal with uh, other aspects of, uh, of synthetic biology will, that will be held uh, during the first week of December. Um, good evening, everybody, and uh, goodbye.